Hey everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on exploring spatial scale, scale and prescribed fire regimes. My name is Mary Nell Armstrong, Outreach Specialist for the Southern Fire Exchange with Tall Timbers Research Station. I'm really excited to be a part of sharing this cutting edge research on spatial scale and prescribed fire with you. Fire scale is something that most land managers have probably either observed to have an influence on ecological effects or has at least wondered about the relationship between the two. But fire scale has rarely been directly explored in research. So I appreciate everyone joining us today to learn about this groundbreaking research. After I go over a few housekeeping items, I'll have a presentation. We'll have a presentation by David Mason from the University of Florida. David will discuss his research exploring spatial scale and prescribed fire regimes. Following the presentation, we'll have 10 minutes for a question and answer session with the speaker. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. David Mason is a PhD student at the University of Florida in the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation, researching how disturbances such as fire and death affect animal-mediated seed dispersal. David received his bachelor's degree in environmental studies from Richard Stockton University and his master's degree at Mississippi State University. And in 2018 at Mississippi State University, David won second place in the three minute thesis competition using his research on niche and neutral mechanisms of forest understory plant assemblages. I'll post a link into the chat um, to view that as well because it, it was really great. <laughs> so welcome David, we're glad to have you with us today and everyone just give us a moment while we trade out presentations. <clears throat> All right, I've been working on this spatial scale presentation a lot and I'm I'm really excited to show you guys uh, some of the things I've been thinking about, um, some of the things in the paper. Uh, but I should also just tell you that I just finished the fifth uh, and final day of my written exam. So like the spatial scale of my brain activity uh, is a little distorted. Um, but I do have a lot of things to show you guys. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the, the paper itself. The citation is there on the slide if you want to check it out. Um, but I'd also be more than happy to email it to anybody that is interested in reading it. So this here is a video about small scale burning. And one of the major issues in fire management in general, I mean, the, the major issue is trying to get more fire on the ground. For federal agencies, the way to increase burn acreage may be to increase scale. They're experienced, they may be understaffed or have limited resources, and it may be more efficient for them to scale up to get more burning done. In our lab, we work with private landowners and spatial scale is often a roadblock for them. They're not gonna burn 500 acres and we may not want them burning 500 acres. So we're working in different directions from different angles uh, to increase burning. In our lab, we're trying to increase burning by demonstrating that landowners can do it at smaller scales, even at ridiculously small scales, demonstrating this video. This, this video is called bow range burning. Trying to get more fire on the ground, uh, but the way that we do that, it's gonna depend on which sector we're working from. We're interested in fire spatial scale because the literature regarding this topic is not very well developed. There isn't much out there, and I'm gonna show you some stats on that in a few minutes. But even if spatial scale isn't well represented in the fire ecology literature, there's ample evidence of scale dependent patterns in ecology in general. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about that evidence as well, because I think it's particularly relevant to the context that we're operating in. Now, typically we have uh, smaller fires when we're doing our prescribed fire experiments, much smaller than a size that would be viable for a federal agency. And simultaneously we have the private sector, a lot of the land, owner, a lot of the land in the Southeast is held by private landowners and they're gonna be operating at small scales as well. Um, but we have this information from the eco ecological literature that says you know, the, the scale dependent effects or, or the effects of fire that we observe at small scales, they may not necessarily scale up in a way that is predictable. So spatial scale is integrated into the closest thing we have to a law in ecology, which is the species area curve. And we see it in birds, plants, insects, and mammals. Uh, we see it in our own research in our lab. Uh, 
On the left here, this is uh, a figure from some research in the Mississippi Delta on forest patches in agricultural landscapes, and they saw more species with increasing patch size. To help you make sense of the mechanism at work here, I want you to imagine that you're managing a longleaf pine system, uh, but it's the size of a peach tree dish. And at that size, it's not gonna be able to contain any species, it's not big enough. But imagine that you're adding one petri dish at a time to this patch and it's getting bigger and bigger. At some point, it's gonna be able to sustain a species. Now imagine you keep on adding land, you're gonna keep adding species. And this is a predictable pattern and it's almost ubiquitous in nature. Now, suppose you're applying fire based solely on this one bit of ecological theory. In that case, you might just keep increasing the size of your burn unit, right? Burn it at all. And that might even be a good model for a fire interior species that requires recently burned area to supply all of its habitat components. But if you're thinking of the species that you may be familiar with uh, or that are living in the systems that you manage, this may not be the case. Many species require fire edges or more specifically, many species will use fire edges because they require areas in different state time since burn. So often we're gonna be rotating burns so we have different stages of time since burn across the property. In other words, we're trying to produce a heterogeneous landscape. On the figure on the right, we have bird species richness that is increasing with habitat diversity. So greater habitat diversity, more bird species. Now, how does this interact with fire? Well, imagine that you take that property that we were talking about before, this, this, this longleaf patch that you're, you're, you're managing, imagine you double it in size, you're going to predictably increase the number of species that are existing there. However, you could keep it the same size and instead vary the, the diversity in your fire regime across that property, say expanding from a narrow set of burn conditions uh, regarding maybe the timing of the burn or the ignition techniques, and you're going to increase the slope of the relationship between species richness and area. In other words, spatial scale increases species richness, but the slope of that relationship is modulated by landscape heterogeneity. And this is the theoretical background to power diversity. A complicated part is that the degree of heterogeneity also depends on the spatial scale that you're observing from. Let's take a look at the Jones Center property here and you can see what I mean. When we look at a zoomed in scale, we would call this a heterogeneous landscape. You can see they're burning at different times, different scales of burn units, different vegetation types with different structures. It's heterogeneous within the bounds of the Jones Center because when we zoom out, we might actually call the Jones Center extremely homogeneous, right? It's, a, it's really a patch of longleaf embedded in an agricultural landscape. The whole point is to show you with a place you're familiar with how our perception changes with our point of view. I'm demonstrating that the relationship between biodiversity and area is simultaneously functioning at many scales. So spatial scale is really complex and we don't have a lot of information about how spatial scale affects fire. At the same time, we have practitioners and landowners potentially burning at different scales and we don't know how our prescribed fire research applies at those different scales. So we wanted to do a literature review to search for general patterns in spatial scale and scale dependent relationships and in the response to fire from species in the Southeastern United States so that we could better understand the situation. And the first thing we did was to look at how spatial scale is talked about in the fire ecology literature. We didn't do a full on literature review. Uh, we just looked at syntheses published in the last decade. The idea was to look at contemporary research, uh, contemporary reviews to see how often we're using data-based inferences regarding fire attributes. And we found that we don't use database inferences to understand spatial scale dependent patterns nearly as much as we do with other common fire attributes. The other thing we wanted to do was to use some data sets to determine whether this was something we should even be thinking about or worrying about. In other words, how does the way we burn compare to how nature burns? How big are lightning generated fires? How does the size distribution of prescribed burns compare? To do this, we use the federal wildland fire occurrence data. And you may know of other data sets uh, and this data set has plenty of issues, uh, but this was, the best stat out there for the comparison we wanted to make because we could sample or we could filter out uh, fires that were, that were natural outs and that were lightning generated. And also this information, this database contained information on spatial scales. 
So here I'm showing the distribution of natural out lightning generated fires and prescribed fires lit for conservation purposes. And this provides some evidence that the size of fires from lightning tends to be distributed across much differently, much differently than prescribed fires. So with the differing constraints in the public and private sector, there's very little research to understand if this mismatch in this data uh, is a problem per se, but there does seem to be a mismatch at least represented in this database. Now, I said there was problems, there's problems with, with the data entries themselves, with you know, date transposition errors and missing geographic information for some of the reporting agencies. There's also problems in how you interpret the data. You know, we don't know how uh, fire suppression or fuel reduction is influencing distribution. And equally important, we don't know how this reflects historical burn regimes or fire on evolutionary time scales, whether we're talking about lit by Aboriginal peoples in the United States or by, or by lightning. But this is instead just to say that we may not be operating as the same, at the same scale as lightning generated fires. I'd also like to note that these distributions could look different from system to system. There's no doubt a lot of different ways we could look at this database, whether you know, temporally or regionally by agency. We just took all the occurrences, which from 39 different states and plotted the distributions because we wanted to know whether the distributions of fire types across this database were different or not. So I filtered for natural out lightning generated fires and prescribed fires lit for conservation purpose. And that left us with like 10,000 fires. And these range in size from less than a hectare to almost 70,000 hectares. And the largest fire was lightning generated and it was approximately 50% larger than any prescribed burn. But a greater proportion of prescribed burns were more than 5,000 hectares than lightning generated burns, which are mostly less than a hectare. And this makes sense. Lightning generated fires can be associated with rain, it can be, and they may go out quickly, but you know, whether by duff ignition or from ignitions that are persisting in rotting snags or heartwood of living trees, uh, you know, the fire can persist until conditions become more favorable and some of those fires are gonna burn for a while and relatively few of those are gonna grow quite large, which could be influenced by you know, different fire breaks or the compartment size. The skew that we see in that lightning generated fires uh, it's definitely not as pronounced in the prescribed burns. And this also makes sense. Think about when you pull a burn permit. How many times have you pulled a permit for a one acre or a two acre fire? Think about your own personal burning distribution. What would that look like? It's probably a distribution skewed towards 50 or 100 acres, something like 20, 40 hectares, unless you work for an agency. Uh, if you're a private landowner, it may be you know, 10 or 20 acres or less than 10 hectares, whatever it is. It probably doesn't look like the lightning generated natural outs in the federal wildland fire occurrence data. I want to clarify that I am not trying to say that we need to match this distribution. The entire point here is to start thinking about spatial scale. I'm saying that we should probably understand the ramifications of changing the scale since we are operating at so many different scales. I also want to note that we see similar patterns in different systems with most fires being small and less fires covering more extensive acreage. This data on the slide is from out west in Canada, uh, but there's similar stuff reported in, in different systems. Like for example, uh, in sand pine forests and, and in the Everglades in Florida. I understand that a lot of the issues in interpreting the causes and the meaning uh, of the size ranges in this data, they're gonna be the same as issues you would have with the federal wildland fire occurrence data. But we can look at the data that we have and we see it in several different sources uh, that fire size for lightning generated fires skews smaller. So with all we might wanna say about the causes behind the distribution of fire size or how much this distribution reflects history or evolutionary pressures, we can say that different data sources show that most naturally occurring lightning generated fires are smaller. But we also wanted to take a look at how the average prescribed fire size varies across the country. In other words, are we operating at different scales when it comes to prescribed burns regionally? This is from the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Database. This is based on uh, satellite data from Landsat data. And that data does not include smaller fires. Uh, it also uses fire perimeter, which can overestimate the area of burn. So the values here should be taken with a grain of salt. The point in showing this data is not to be specific, it's just to show that there's variation across the country. 
In other words, we wanted to see, do we have database inferences regarding fire scale? How do prescribed fires compare to naturally occurring fires? And is there variation in the size of prescribed burns in different parts of the country? And in the broadest sense, we can see the prescribed fire size generally increasing east to west, but the lowest averages are in the northeast and midwest, which makes sense given the scale of operational units and the degree of development and population density in those regions. So we had data that says we're operating at different scales in regards to regional patterns and prescribed burns and in regards to natural generated lightning fires. But overall, we have a lack of focus on data-based inferences in the fire ecology literature. Now, why is that? And here, I think it would be a good moment to take a step back. We're aware that there are numerous concerns when it comes to fire management. One of the primary issues is we aren't getting enough burning done. And I wanna keep that in mind. We think scale is an attribute we're thinking about, but getting the fire on the ground at a level that maintains a system or reduces danger, that's the priority. But that doesn't mean that if and when you do have flexibility, you wouldn't want to adjust scale to meet objectives if you had the information regarding spatial scale effects to make decisions. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about practitioners and research. We have research trying to inform managers. Managers are applying that research. So practitioners and researchers are dependent on one another. Researchers provide data to practitioners, but without the practitioners pointing out the need, we have a lack of demand and funding. And spatial scale is probably one of those things where we realize that this attribute may be of interest, but if you're sitting there thinking there's no way you can practically change the scale at which you're burning, uh, in that case, you're gonna be less interested in, in funding research regarding spatial scale. Let's also think about the way that we as researchers design experiments. Spatial scale is going to be inherently confounded with other attributes of fire. And you could standardize size to account for that, but you know, where are you gonna find variation in fire size? You need to get at the extremes that, that you know, a good inference is gonna call for. And if you even do find enough extremes in prescribed fire burn sizes, are, are those gonna be in similar systems? Are they gonna be burned in the same way at the same time? And you're gonna run into similar problems if you're trying to collect existing research for a meta-analysis of many experiments aren't gonna be reporting all the attributes that you need to control for. So all that is to say, spatial scale is inherently problematic to study directly from multiple directions. But we do have a lot of data from other areas of ecology and that's what I'm gonna talk about. I wanna see if we can understand how variation in scale could potentially be of concern based on other scale dependent relationships in ecology. So let's start by thinking about habitat. This cotton right here is demonstrating a really important point. His whole world just got burned down. If you know anything about cotton rats, you may know that they have little highways through the understory and, and those just got burned down too. So the cotton rat has lost its structure and its cover. And his response is just to sit there and hide behind a little toothpick of, of a twig. Fire is gonna change the abiotic and biotic environment. Uh, and we can think about all the different pathways that these basic components on the slide here are gonna be manipulated by fire, whether directly or indirectly. But plants are a massive element of managing habitat and fire is gonna remove plant biomass from the understory. From an animal's perspective, what does that mean? Removing plant biomass changes the distribution of habitat components, mostly via changes to cover. That's what we see going on with, with our cotton rat friend here. And you're gonna have other organisms that are seeking to capitalize on that habitat dispersion, right? It's an excellent situation for a predator uh, to arrive at where its prey has lost uh, its structure and cover. And we see this here in the Southeast. You've probably seen Mississippi kites circling uh, around one of your prescribed burns before. I chose this picture from Australia. And I could say it's to demonstrate that this pattern is uh, you know, general across different systems, but really it's just a really cool picture. And that's actually not even just a cool picture because these guys really are setting fires themselves. Obviously the fire itself can be a negative stimulus for species, but the dispersion of habitat components is also an important facet of fire spatial scale to consider in regards to how uh, species will respond. And the size of the fire, that's gonna influence the distance between habitat components. But we also need to think about how long that dispersion is going to last. And we've been talking about spatial scale a lot, but we live in a world with space and time and, and 
time and space are intertwined. That is to say that the cover is going to come back eventually. There is a reason you see these raptors visiting, you know, during the fire or, or starting the fire or immediately afterwards. You're not going to see them flying by the spot, you know, six years later. So many of these spatial components are inherently temporally dynamic. And that's good for us to keep in mind. Now, depending on the movement ability or life history of the organisms we're talking about, that temporal component is going to dictate how long we can expect the spatial effects of fire to last. And we can use what we know about organisms to predict how we might expect them to respond to fires at different scales and connect them with that, how we could expect ecological interactions that they engage in to change the spatial scale. So this is a theoretical figure derived from the literature. And the point is to think about how species respond to and use fire differently and how we would predict, predict that response based on the scale of fire. When we look at the literature, there are differences in species regarding whether they use the edge or the interior, but they also have difference in locomotive ability. So at the top left here, we have two contrasting things. We have a species with a, we have two species with high movement ability, um, but one is an edge species and one is an interior. And then we look at the bottom, we have an interior and edge species that both don't move well. And the response of all of these organisms is gonna be related to the distribution of habitat components that they require and their movement ability. And we can think of any of the wildlife species on the left side here and how, that, how their response may affect the ecological interactions they engage in and generates spatial scale dependent gradients in ecological interactions. And that's what's going on on the right here. So turkeys are a great example to demonstrate this dichotomy. You know, they need recently burned and unburned areas. That's why they need edge because they aren't gonna be willing to penetrate past a certain distance into a burn because they wanna be close to those other habitat components. So you're gonna get this bullseye effect we see on the right. Um, and that's, that's been demonstrated in the literature. And what kind of scale and uh, scale dependent interactions are you gonna expect the, the turkey to engage in? It's gonna depend on how far into the, how far into the burn it's willing to penetrate. So there's a couple things to note here. Species in this system, for this example, it's species in the in forests of the Southeast. Their response to fire may be positive at some scales and negative at others. It's not one size fits best for all. And I wanna show you this two, based on two major things. The scale of response is different depending on life history traits and those differences in response can generate patterns in the gradient strength of interactions. Of course though, there's gonna be other elements and axes of habitat components and fire interacting here too, right? You can think about the rear canopy cover, or the structure of the understory and the midstory. It's also gonna depend on the type of fire. Fire that leaves nothing left to eat is different than a fire that you know, leaves fruit on the plants or some intact insect carcasses on the forest floor. But what you're gonna end up with is a gradient of interaction strength that is generated by the differential responses of these species. And it's been demonstrated and we're gonna to get to some of that evidence in a second. But we can apply this logic to all kinds of organisms. I think about a wind dispersed plant that can maybe you know, travel a couple hundred meters, how far that's gonna get into a burn. In contrast, think about something that's more self, to, self dispersed, some of, the, some of the legumes that drop their seeds. You know, how far can they get into the, how far can they penetrate into the burn? Uh, and you know, related to time again, uh, another way of thinking about that is how long will it take them, how many generations will it take them to penetrate the interior of a burn. Now it's important to note that we don't have recommendations for every species across all systems. This theoretical graph is based on information. Some of it is regarding recommendations. Other is pieced together from home range size or the movement ability of their life history traits. And we know this is gonna be context dependent. How productive is the site? What predators persist in that landscape? What season of fire did you burn in? The point here is certainly not to say this is the exact size that you should be burning for a species X, Y, or Z. The point here is to say that you could probably determine such a scale related response uh, for various contexts and that this could be a useful concept for managing natural resources. So we know there's widespread evidence of spatial scale dependent relationships in ecology. It makes sense that we would see these with such a strong selection force like fire. And we do have some evidence from the literature that we're gonna show. So this is from some research done in our lab. 
Uh, we know that deer are attracted to recently burned areas and we've documented that at different scale as well as indirect effects on the understory plant communities that that attraction of herbivory generates. So after a fire, we get a green up pretty quick and those plants are quickly trying to establish or reestablish in that open space. And that reestablishing or establishing vegetation is gonna be highly palatable and nutritious and therefore attractive to herbivores. And we call this a magnet effect. And this magnet effect is incorporated in the pirate herbivory. We see that in African savannas and patch burn grazing, but we also see it here in the Southeast. The interesting thing uh, about this response to fire from deer is how it interacts with spatial scale, at least for, for this dog. Now we documented this increase at relatively smaller scales, uh, like less than a hectare and then about 10 hectares. Does that response scale up? So here at the top of this figure, this is research from uh, Dr. Lashley conducted at Fort Bragg. We're seeing burn regimes uh, in different years and in different seasons. The colors you need to pay attention to are the red, which is a growing season burn. It's the most recent burn on the on represented. And the purple is a dormant season burn from three years prior. The hatched polygon on the bottom figure, that is a doe's core range while she's fawning. The recent growing season burn covered a majority of the core range. And unlike that intensive selective pressure we saw at smaller scales, the doe totally shifted her core range uh, into the dormant season burn from three years prior. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that her core range is still abutting the edges of those uh, of the recent burns. So we're still seeing an intensive selection for the edge. So we see this pattern, and, and this pattern is likely driven by changes in the dispersion of cover. So even though the, the, the deer wants that high quality forage associated with the recently burned area, when it's fawning and that area doesn't have enough cover, it's going to avoid it uh, to prevent predation. And we see similar scale dependent responses going on with turkeys. As we discussed before, turkeys need different types of vegetation and different times since burn. Uh, to, to find all of their requisite habitat components. And on the left, we see how hens are selecting areas for egg laying, for incubation, and post nesting periods. And the forest is broken down into you know, unburned or unburned landscapes uh, and then time since burn. And then they're providing the area available to the turkey. Uh, and you can compare that to the, to the area it actually used, which is a way to look at selection. So hens were using burns in, in the unburned areas in about, the, uh, about relevant to, the, to their availability. But within post nesting areas, hens more often make use of burned areas than over non-burns. The point that I'm trying to get at is that hens need a variety of areas to complete their life cycle or turkeys need a variety of areas. And that includes recently burned areas. However, if we take a look at the figure on the bottom right, we can see that not all burned areas are equally valuable to the turkey. Now this is based on uh, simulated data, but it is parameterized based on uh, turkey field movement. And we can generally see that the decreasing pattern in daily use of burns uh, as the fire size gets larger and larger. In addition, rectangular shaped burns were more often used than square shaped burns. And that allows me to bring up an important consideration alongside with spatial scale and that shape. In many cases, the effects of scale are going to some degree uh, also be affected by shape because shape interacts with perimeter area ratios and edge characteristics and distance to interior, which are all things we were talking about with spatial scale. There's another big time factor mediating potential scale dependent relationships with fire that I've sort of been saved to talk about till now. We know that spatial scale dependent patterns can be affected by a homo homogeneity and heterogeneity of the burn. Many prescribed burns are homogenous for various reasons, both related to operational constraints or, or the goal of the management. You now practitioners may be trying to beat back hardwoods and you know they wanna burn as much as they can when they can because they let those hardwoods get to a certain size, they're not gonna be able to burn it again in the future. On the other hand, you might be trying to burn as much acreage as possible and you're trying to do it as efficiently as possible. And that could also create homogeneity. 
Now, some practitioners and some research does uh, apply different uh, ignition techniques or, or burns in different times of the day, like in suboptimal conditions later on in the day, to try to create a heterosaic uh, mosaic of patches. So how you ignite is going to change the fire behavior and the effects of the fire. And that patchiness could, in a sense, like extend the edge of the fire, allow species to penetrate deeper into the interior. It's also refugia you could think about, and these will occur with like, you know, rocky fuel breaks or, or gullies or moist areas that limit fire spread and intensity. And you can think of heterogeneity and patchiness and refugia as other factors altering the slope of those spatial scale dependent fire relationships. So previously we talked about the species area relationship and how habitat diversity increased the slope of that relationship. In this case, heterogeneity, patchiness, perfusia, they're likely gonna modulate the strength of the relationship between scale and species response or scale and the strength of ecological interactions. And this is always something to keep in mind when we're talking about the effects of spatial scale on wildlife. So that distance to edge, whether we're talking true edge or distance to a green patch, you know, in, in a mosaic, in a, in, a, in a patchy mosaic, that's really going to matter for insect species because they don't travel very far, uh, or many species don't travel very far. They're most likely going to need to be colonizing from outside the burn or a surviving patch of vegetation. Now we talked about the deer response and the reason we have to believe that there would be spatial scale dependent responses that we patched together from different pieces of research and, and, and ecological theory, but this is hard evidence here. We have two experiments demonstrating decreased herbivory and seed predation by insects with increasing distance from the fire edge. So we have a, a spatial scale generated gradient in ecological interactions. Now in ecology, we often use model systems to make general influences. And we have a lot of limitations to studying spatial scale as, as fire, with fires we've discussed before. But we see here that the animal's mobility is limiting ecological interactions. We can make similar inferences regarding fire spatial scale and seed dispersal. Think about ants, they're big time seed dispersers. Uh, they can disperse the majority of understory plants in some systems. They're definitely going to be uh, limited by spatial scale as far as distance to different fruiting plants. We talked about that magnet effect, and that's certainly going to attract many consumers, many of which can be seed dispersers. However, when we're talking about seed dispersal, most of the time people are thinking about birds. And birds can also be attracted to recently burned areas uh, because they represent a resource pulse for them. And this is some of my research. I've grouped species quite broadly into two groups, dispersers and non-dispersers. Um, and I have concentrated bird activity within recently burned areas and one year rough using a perch. I monitor that with a camera trap. And then beneath that perch, I place a seed trap. So we see more detections, more total detections on average over the first few months after a fire for dispersers than other birds in recent burns. But we see no difference in the one year rough. If we look over at the time series on the right, we see a similar pattern. The peak at least is the same. So where is this difference on the left coming from? Well, it's coming from the time immediately after the fire during the magnet effect. And this increase in dispersers towards recently burned areas, that influences seed rain. Plants have differing reproductive phenology, right? We have plants that flower and fruit in the early growing season. Most that are gonna do so later in the growing season during the, in the later growing season in the fall and a subset of species that are gonna produce fruit that persists throughout the winter and throughout the dormant season into the following year. And with that spike in disperser activity and recent burns happening right after the fire, we are seeing more seed rain of blackberries, which are fruiting during that time. Now blackberries provide habitat components for wildlife. So this here is demonstrating that wildlife species are demonstrating the seeds, but the plant provide habitat for wildlife through fire. Birds have a well-documented uh, preferences for edges and interiors. And similarly, plants, uh, different fruiting plants can be found on the edges of patches or, or in canopy openings and in shaded areas. So this is to say that there's you know, spatial scale interactions going on between the disperser and the plants. So it's very likely that spatial scale fire is generating gradients in animal activity, which is then generating gradients in herbivory or seed dispersal, 
that will influence what kind of plants you get. And therefore the distribution of habitat components. Now these spatial scales of fire I keep hitting on, whether it's the response of wildlife to different ecological interactions, do they always happen? Well, we can think of three different types of responses to varying the scale of a fire. We've been discussing a lot that exhibit either some kind of continuous or some kind of threshold response. If we think about the herbivory decreasing with edge or the seed dispersal that could be decreasing with edge, we might continuously decrease until we hit the response is zero. On the other hand, you might see a decreasing relationship that abruptly knocks off based on saying an animal's unwillingness to penetrate any deeper into a burned area. But we could actually expect scale independent responses when it comes to something like plants colonizing from the seed bank or they're or re-sprouting after a fire. Those plants don't need to colonize immediately after the fire and they, you know, they could pop up anywhere in the, in the burn regardless of the size of the burn. But those plants that are exhibiting a scale independent response, those re-sprouters or those seed banks, they're gonna be interacting with organisms that are experiencing a scale dependent response. And this discrepancy could produce some interesting patterns. For example, plants in the interior, they may be released from competition with plants incoming via dispersal, or they may be released from herbivory pressure. Uh, and that could generate spatial patterns in the plant community. And colonization of some species is problematic, right? In such cases, larger burns, they could you know, prevent invasion by non-native species or, or protect species that are favored for a particular management goal uh, from herbivores and sea predators. Increasing the spatial scale could be an effective way to promote some species by utilizing the reductions in, in top-down pressure or reducing competition within the burn block interior or are preventing others from reaching the burn block interior by diminishing their ability to disperse. In other words, spatial scale dependent or spatial scale dependent effects are a tool uh, that could be used regarding the spatial scale fire. All right, so we've got this situation where we have variation in the spatial scale we burn at because of potentially differing needs and constraints in public and private sectors. And we even see differences across the country regarding prescribed burns differing with the regions. Along with this variation, we're seeing that the size distributions of naturally generated fires, at least in the federal wildland fire currents data and other resources, they're showing that lightning generated fires are distributed across scale differently than prescribed burns. With all this variation in scale, we don't have a lot of data to understand how scale is influencing the effects of fire on wildlife, on ecological interactions, on the dispersion of habitat components. However, based on the ecological literature, there's reason to believe that our spatial scale effects are important for ecological interactions and animal responses. Moving forward, researchers can report the fire characteristics that are being suggested by members of the community following those best practices. If the data is out there on everything, including spatial scale, uh, it may be possible someday to do meta-analysis that can explore the effects of spatial scale while controlling for all these confounding factors. Otherwise, researchers can look to small scale model systems like we saw with the insects and the sea predation uh, or simulations like we saw with the turkey research. For practitioners, I hope I have provided you with some food for thought uh, that can go along with all the other considerations that you have when you're, when you're managing uh, your property. I appreciate y'all for giving me the chance to speak and share what I found in the literature and what Dr. Lashley and I have been talking about uh, and thinking about for a while. I'd like to thank Tall Timbers uh, for, for, for funding my uh, dissertation and for allowing me to do research on their property. This is where I do uh, the seed dispersal toward recent burn research. Uh, I'd also like to thank members of my lab and you know, all the volunteers at, at Tall Timbers who have helped out uh, with burning in the past. If you're interested in following what we're doing, you can follow us on social media. We are very active in trying to reach people uh, with our science. With that, I'll, I'll take any questions. This, uh, this deer here is gonna be me trying to figure out which box the questions are coming from. But uh, I guess I'll just check the fancy uh, webinar box. We have the Q&A box. Thank you, David.
Thanks so much for that great presentation. Um, at this point in our program, we'd like to invite uh, you to ask any questions that you have for David in the Q&A window. We'll try to get through as many of those as we can. If you joined us during the presentation, once again, my name is Mary Nell Armstrong, Outreach Specialist with Southern Fire Exchange. And we just had a presentation by David Mason with the University of Florida, where we explored the concept of spatial scale and its effects on prescribed fire regimes. I posted several resources into the chat uh, at this point, including the full article, uh, Lashley et al. 2021, as well as a research brief that Southern Fire Exchange put together on this research and was hosted in MailChimp, and um, sorry, Firelines. There's a MailChimp link to that, and as well as a episode of Fire Ecology Chats where this research was discussed, and that's a podcast. Uh, in the Q&A feature, as I mentioned, you can upvote questions that you're interested in by clicking the up arrow next to the question in the Q&A box. This will help us get to the questions that participants are most interested in first. And please remember to type your questions into the Q&A box and not the chat box. So it looks like we have two questions so far, David. Dexter asks, has anyone tried to develop a standardized post-burn effects assessment that includes scale of burn in assessment? So I'd first like to qualify my response by saying that I've, I've never worked for some of the different agencies, but I know uh, for a fact that they have different assessments that they do after a burn, right? That, that a lot of these, like they may be walking, doing some kind of visual assessment of you know, how far the fire, you know, what kind of crown scorch you had or you know, what kind of mortality you have. Um, I don't know that anyone has included uh, an attempt that's, I mean, they, they may be talking about how big the fire was and you know how intense or severe it was, um, but I am not aware of anything that, uh, you know, maybe tried to like I, I walk a gradient as you know, towards the interior and looked at, but it's, it's certainly possible. I mean, I know that they collect a ton of information um, and people collect information a lot of different ways. Uh, I want to I'm add, Dexter added an, amend, an amendum to the question and said assessment of prescribed fire would collect data to assess scale effects. Yeah, I don't know if if, uh, if, if Dexter is just suggesting that we could do that because that's a good idea or if he knows of a, if, if he knows of a way that that's been done before. Um, but I would certainly love to see anything related to uh, you know, post what they would call fire effects uh, and, and looking at some kind of scale dependent patterns. It wouldn't shock me if there was something that you could get at there. Um, now, I, developing a protocol for doing so, I mean, you're gonna run into the same problems that I've been talking about with the confounding effects. But I guess if you had you know, a bunch of people collecting some kind of, what I'm thinking is walking a gradient towards the interior and some kind of measuring, you'd have to be monitoring animal activity somehow. Um, you could, uh, you know, add that into the, the repertoire of things that you paid attention to. And with enough fires of varying different conditions and varying systems, you probably could tease out some scale, some scale dependent effects. So that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions for now. So everyone else can go ahead and add your questions. I've got a couple. So that figure that you had, the ecological interactions figure, I yep. think it's really interesting, and I'd bet that a lot of land managers would have interest in more figures like that with with more species included. Is there any potential to expand that research and kind of do that same kind of um, research dive for other species? Yeah, I mean, and and there's, you know, you could you could really incorporate a ton of research in doing that. And then I guess you could you know, try to include some varying context because again, all the fires aren't going to be the same as, as we, you know, as we all, as we all know. Um, but, you know, I don't want to give the impression with that figure, like one of the things that worries me about that figure in some ways is that I don't want to give the impression that, you know, uh, I would hate to have somebody like, you know, basing their burning strategy specifically on that. That's not the point of that. The point is to say, we could, we could like, 
we could measure things and try to figure out that scale dependent response, depending on whatever our goals were. Scale is a part of the system that you could use to uh, achieve management goals. Now, that being said, yeah, I mean, you could, you know, you could work through a huge framework and add all kinds of species and it would be really, really cool. Um, you could get deep with it for sure. Yeah, this seem, this research really seems like it's opening a door to a lot more research because fa spatial scale is so so poorly understood in the literature and for how impactful it is on our ecosystems. Yeah, it's just, it's really, I mean, I think it's just really hard. Like I do, we say poorly understood, I think maybe in terms of like actually quantifying it, but I think a lot of the, the things I'm talking about, they're, they're probably, uh, people understand that that's happening. Um, it's just that actually trying to disentangle it is really, really, is really difficult and that's probably why we don't see a lot of work work on it i mean that's it's gonna it's it's gonna take some thinking to to disentangle the uh, the different factors of fire right i think that's how a lot of fire ecology research starts is practitioners are seeing effects they're observing or at least getting an idea that smaller scale fires might promote one species, whereas large scale fires might promote another, like a red cocky yeah. pecker. Yep. And it's taking those kind of broad assumptions and somehow, yeah, teasing out all those other confounding variables. Yeah. That's challenging. Yeah. I'm a, uh, yeah, I mean, that's like, I mean, a lot of it comes from observations of, you know, really catastrophic wildfires and stuff too. So you get this like one really big scale that you have information on, but you're kind of missing a lot of things in between. But there's a lot of like just observational stuff about you know the Yellowstone, the big Yellowstone fire, and how long it took plants to come back in this area or that, and the degree of herbivory depending on different species and stuff. But you know, developing you're talking about you know adding to that, adding to that figure, uh, and like I just I my mind immediately jumps to like a dream scenario that is probably a little out of reach at this point, but I mean, you could imagine some kind of web tool, right? That like you could input characteristics of your landscape or and the organisms you're working with, and you know try to generate uh, an optimal burn size. I mean, it's theoretically possible. And that's another thing we didn't even get at is you know we're talking about burning for this or that, but what do you do when you want to talk about optimal burn conditions for a community? Um, mm -hmm. and it just gets it just gets more complicated, but still theoretically possible to quantify. Yeah, and I, I was curious what, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but why you chose those species specifically? Is it that there was enough research already available related to spatial scale and those species, or were they kind of species of interest to the Southeast? Yeah, I guess a combination of both. Um, first, a combination of those two things you just said, uh, they're, they're more well studied than other things, um, or in the case of insects, the pattern has actually been demonstrated with them, spatial scale depending gradient. So they're gonna get included because they really have evidence. Um, but also, you know, we just wanted to get like a wide range of, you know, different types of organisms and different ways that they use the environment, I think was the goal there. Yeah, definitely did a great job of that. Tortoises and grasshoppers and yeah. <laughs> birds. Yeah. Okay, does anyone else have any more questions for David? You can put your questions into the Q&A box. I'll go ahead and add the continuing forestry education link in the chat. Anyone who's looking for CFE credits, you have to follow that link and then uh, fill out your information that way. Okay, we have another question from Joel. Yeah. Given the various constraints of land managers with time, resources, and knowledge, has any thought been given to farming that work out? Yeah, I think uh, if I understand Joel's point, uh, He's saying, yeah, it's a good idea, but who's going to do it? Um, you know, we have a million things on our plate. And I, I, from the experience I have with, have had with land managers, I see the kind of job it is. I, I understand that for sure. Um, 
So, you know, who, who's actually going to do this research that we've already established is going to be really hard. If you actually wanted to conduct something like this for real, I do think it would have to be farmed out. You could uh, ask land managers to fill out something like uh, Dexter was talking about. Maybe you could get them to do that. Again, they have a lot of things to do, but perhaps they could report scale and maybe a couple metrics. It would be very easy for them to report, but the majority of it, I think you'd combine that information with graduate students doing work. And uh, ideally you would want like a network because we know that fire behaves differently with different systems and all this. They, so you're gonna, you're gonna want people working in, in different systems uh, to get any general patterns. But I agree with them, Who, who's, gonna, who's gonna do it? It's, it's gonna take an, a huge undertaking for sure. Yeah, there's already so much on land managers plates and there's always more. Yeah. Always more to burn, always more to manage. <laughs> Right, and that's the and that is you know they're rightly focused on the correct goal. I hope I, I express that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, David, if you want to um, stop sharing your slides, now bring up my last closing slide. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, well, David, thank you so much for sharing your exciting new research with us. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope that you gained something that will be of use to you in your fire management program. I'll add David's email and or his uh, work email into the chat box now if you'd like to reach out with any other questions. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys.